Hello everyone and welcome to the New England Lymphoma Workshop brought to you by the Lymphoma Research Foundation. My name is Joe Masiri and today we're going to be discussing some of the latest research as it pertains to lymphoma. And we are lucky enough to have with us two esteemed doctors today. Our first is Karen Jacobson of the Dana-Farber Institute and Jeremy Abramson of the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center. Thank you so much, doctors, for being with us today. Thank you. Our pleasure. Now, everyone out there watching in Facebook land, we'd like you to participate in this conversation. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section. We will try to get to all of them today. And use the hashtag CARTCellChat. Once again, that's CARTCellChat. You'll see that pop up on your screen throughout. And please, let us know what questions you have as we go throughout. But we'd like to start with uh, some basic information for people who might just be learning about lymphoma. So um, Dr. Jacobson, let's start with you. What is lymphoma and, and how is it diagnosed? So lymphomas are cancers of a type of white blood cell that we have in our body called the lymphocyte. Um, and these are white blood cells that are a part of our immune system. They're part of our inflammatory response to things. They're also part of our tissue injury response. Um, they live in multiple parts of our body. Most of them are found in lymph nodes. So we have lymph nodes all throughout our body, but we also have healthy lymphocytes everywhere um, from our head to our toes because we have to be able to protect our body from infection all throughout. So most people will present with lymphoma um, because they have uncontrolled growth of these lymphocytes within lymph nodes and they'll present within large lymph nodes, but they can present with a rash on their skin or they can present with abnormal blood cell counts, they can present with a mass in their liver, they can present with an ulcer in their stomach because we have these lymphocytes everywhere throughout our body. And how common is lymphoma? So it's not the most common cancer uh, that we uh, diagnose for sure, but um, it does account for you know tens of thousands of new cases of, of cancer in the United States each year. Okay. And uh, Dr. Abramson, what is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is one of the latest advances in treating cancer, not just lymphoma, but multiple cancer types. And it's really a general term that means using the patient's own immune system to destroy cancer cells. And there are several different ways that we can do that. And how does CAR T cell therapy fit into that? So CAR T cell is one of the most recent advances in immunotherapy. Um, patients own T cells are part of their immune system and T cells uh, help fight off infection as Dr. Jacobson just pointed out. And T cells are really the heavy lifters in fighting off things like viruses, fungal infections, uh, and can, if uh, used correctly, fight cancer cells. And uh, CAR T cells are a way to do that. Now, patients' own T cells don't usually fight off their cancer cells because patients' cancer cells are derived from their own healthy cells. And so patients' T cells don't recognize them as foreigners to be uh, destroyed. So what a CAR T cell is, is where a patient's own T cell is genetically engineered to actually recognize their cancer cells as invaders and destroy them. So what is the process like for a patient? What can they expect if they're going through CAR T-cell therapy? So first, patients' T-cells have to be collected in order to be engineered. So patients undergo a process called apheresis, where uh, an IV line is placed, the blood is taken from the patient, goes through a machine which collects out their lymphocytes, and their healthy blood is returned back to them. Those T-lymphocytes are then used to manufacture their CAR T-cells. Um, that's usually done by sending those cells that were collected to a central manufacturing location where the cells are engineered. Uh, they're then grown up in the laboratory, so there's a large proportion of them, millions of cells, which are then returned back to the hospital where the patient's being treated. Those cells are then administered back to the patient, just like a blood transfusion, where they go in and get to work. So what's the main difference when those cells return to a patient's body from when they left? They're bionic. <laughs> These cells are now specifically programmed to go after their cancer cells. Uh, and so when these cells go in, they're gonna recognize the lymphoma cells. They're gonna then be activated. And a T cell gets activated when it encounters its target, whether that's an infection or whether it's a cancer cell. So the, those T cells then go in, they get activated, they grow and they divide. This is a living drug. So these cells grow, divide, and destroy cancer cells as they work. And that process of growth and division not only kills cancer cells, it can also lead to some of the toxicities that we see and manage. So um, Dr. Jacobson, then what's the difference then between a stem cell transplantation and a CAR T cell therapy? 
Well, it, um, the biggest difference is the type of cells that we're, that we're giving, right? So in a stem cell transplant, um, we're giving stem cells, and stem cell transplants come in two main flavors, right? So we have stem cell transplants that are from the patient's own stem cells, and in, in that kind of therapy, the stem cell is not actually the therapy, it's the rescue from the therapy. The, the therapy is high-dose chemotherapy, but it's such high doses that a patient's own um, blood counts wouldn't come back after the uh, chemotherapy wears off. So we rescue them from that side effect by giving them their own stem cells. Stem cells are the cells that give rise to all of the different components of our blood. They're, they're a very early progenitor cell um, that gives rise to all the different blood cell counts, including the T cells. Um, that uh, are using CAR T cells. The other type of stem cell transplant is a donor stem cell transplant or an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And in that, in, in that therapy, the stem cell is actually the therapy. So you're actually um, giving, you give people some gentle chemotherapy um, to, usually some gentle chemotherapy to um, allow the host to um, accept the donor stem cells. And then over time, those donor stem cells replace the immune system of the patient with, uh, uh, with, those uh, with cells from the donor um, stem cells. And what happens then is, as Jeremy pointed out, you know, the host's immune, the patient's immune system, own immune system doesn't recognize their cancer as foreign, but this is a new immune system that is different enough from the cancer cell that we hope that that new immune system will um, uh, lead to a, a graft versus lymphoma or leukemia response. The T cells are totally different. These are the patient's own T cells, um, as we're doing them right now, um, and they are uh, being given as the therapy. They're, they're specifically T cells. They're, they're, they're not going to give rise to other types of immune cells. They're T cells that are gonna fight the patient's own cancer. So whereas a stem cell uh, transplant, it views it as a different immune system, is what you're saying when it comes in, versus the T cells, which it's, it's seeing the same thing, just doesn't have that receptor uh, for the cancer cells, is that correct? Um, so the the donor stem cell is, is you know the donor stem cell is giving the patients an entire new immune system. So so all of the patients' immune cells are going to be coming from that new donor, gotcha. um, and then that hopefully that donor is like I said different enough from the host that the new donor immune system would recognize the cancer and hopefully fight it. For the for CAR T cells, you're giving patients a specific a specific type of immune cell that has been programmed to fight the cancer, and uh, it's, it's sort of a one-shot therapy. So at this point, can you have donor CAR T cells? It's a great question, um, and it's something that's in development. So um, obviously the, the problem with, just as the donor, just in a, as in a, in a donor stem cell transplant, the donor uh, immune system would be different enough, we hope it's different enough from the host that they, it would recognize their cancer and fight their cancer. It may be different enough from the host that it also fights healthy body, you know, healthy body tissue, health, you know, the liver, the lungs, the skin, the GI tract. Um, and that's one of the downsides of a donor stem cell transplant, that it has that kind of risk um, that can both be a fatal risk as well as a, you know, a quite morbid risk for patients to live with side effects like that. Um, so for, for CAR T cells, there is a move to try to do allogeneic or donor CAR T cells, um, mostly because, as Jeremy pointed out, when we collect the patient's own T cells and we send them to a, a lab to manufacture the T cells, that process takes time. And it can take sometimes you know, anywhere from two to four weeks for those T cells to be manufactured manufactured and these patients have you know fast growing cancers and they're they could be getting sick during that time too sick even sometimes to get their T cells back when they when they finally are ready so if we had donor T cells ready and available, this is something we can pull off the shelf and give a patient right away. The problem is you don't want to give a patient a donor, a donor T cells that will also attack the patient's healthy tissue. And so there are really neat gene editing uh, technologies where uh, that, misc that risk is minimized by taking out some of the genetic material of those T cells so that they don't recognize host wow. tissues and putting in the DNA for the CAR just like we do for the autologous so uh, T cells. That's a very delicate balance that you have there. It is, for sure. So then you mentioned that the donor uh, CAR T cells is something that's still in development. Are there approved um, CAR T cell therapies at this point? Yep, there are two approved CAR T cell therapies at this point. There is a um, the product from Novartis, which is called Kimbraya, which has been FDA approved for the treatment of pediatric and young adult uh, B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and young adult, in that case, uh, goes up to age 25. And then there is a um, FDA-approved product for adult uh, aggressive lymph uh, B-cell lymphomas uh, from Kite and Gilead, which is called uh, Yescarta. Okay. Now, uh, we have a question here from Facebook. Uh, Michelle wants to know, what are some of the outcomes of CAR T-cell therapy for mantle cell lymphoma? And I'll 
leave it to you, Elaine. Mm -hmm. Well, we have less evidence for mantle cell lymphoma than diffuse large B-cell lymphoma right now. Currently, CAR T-cell therapy is not FDA approved for mantle cell lymphoma. It's approved for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, it's approved for primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma, and it's approved for transformed follicular lymphoma, as well as a, a variant of aggressive B-cell lymphoma called double hit lymphoma. Mantle cell lymphoma is a very distinct disease. Um, currently, I'd say it's been less explored. The responses in small uh, numbers to date have not been as robust as with uh, the aggressive B-cell lymphoma, as I just mentioned. But I would say that it's early yet, and I think uh, we're going to see more evidence in mantle cell lymphoma and hopefully optimize this technology uh, to treat those patients as well. Excellent. I just want to do a reset for those of you who might be watching on Facebook. You've tuned in to a chat on CAR T cells here brought to you by the Lymphoma Research Foundation. We are at the New England Lymphoma Workshop here in Copley Square at the Marriott in Boston, Massachusetts. So my next question for you doctors are, what are um, the different types of CAR T cells? So CAR T cells in general right now, um, what, what Karen and I are talking about are CAR T cells for, for large cell lymphoma, which are targeting a, a, an antigen on the surface of lymphoma cells called CD19. So the currently FDA-approved CAR T cells that you just heard about, the Kimraya, otherwise called Tysagen leclusol, or the Escarda, otherwise called Axicabdogen silalusol, are both anti-CD19 CAR T cells. And CD19 is expressed on all B-cell lymphomas as well as acute B-cell lymphoblastic leukemia. There is uh, a CAR T cell in development for a different blood disease called multiple myeloma that targets a protein called BCMA. And we're likely to see other uh, CAR T cells targeting different proteins coming along. The other difference, other than what they're targeting, is how the cells are actually co-stimulated. Now, it turns out a T cell needs to do more than just see its target in order to be fully turned on or activated. It requires a stimulus called a, called a co-stimulation or a second signal. It's part of the way our immune system protects itself from being hyperactivated all the time, uh, lest we all walk around filled with inflammation all the time. Uh, we, need, we need a second signal for co-stimulation. And so part of the CAR T cell, this chimeric antigen receptor, which is what CAR stands for, has a second uh, domain built into it, which is a co-stimulation domain. The Tysagen leclusol, or Kimraya, uses a co-stimulation domain called 41BB, uh, while the Yescarda, uh, or Axicabdogen silalusol, uses a co-stimulation domain called CD28. So I'd say right now, those are the two big differences among CAR T cells, which co-stimulation they use, and of course, what target they go after. And the co-stimulation in this sense, would that be what prevents these um, cells from expanding at a greater weight, as uh, Dr. Jacobson mentioned earlier? Great question. So they do induce some biologic differences in the CAR T cells. So CD28 co-stimulation leads to a much more rapid and robust expansion of the CAR T cells, as opposed to 41BB co-stimulation where it's a little bit delayed. Uh, they both expand, and they both expand well, but with slightly different rates. And that actually um, leads to different timing of some of the side effects. So if you have a more earlier rapid expansion, then you see the potential side effects earlier than if you have a slightly delayed expansion. And so, for example, the Yescarda, we see the onset of this cytokine release syndrome as early as two days, uh, while with the um, 41BB, it's more like three to five days. And so there are slight differences, uh, but both activate and both expand well. So, uh, Dr. Jacobson, do you want to take from there since um, Dr. Abramson brought up some of the side effects? What mm -hmm. other side effects might someone see from uh, the CAR T-cell therapies? So he, he already introduced the concept of the cytokine release syndrome. Which, what, what does that mean yeah. for people watching at home? So um, if you think about it when just, I think a, an easy way analogy is just think about what happens when you have the flu, right? So you have the flu and you suffer high fevers, night sweats, uh, you know, just lack of energy, um, malaise, body aches, headaches. Those are all actually caused by activation of the T cells that are fighting the flu virus. Um, and that's what's happening when we give these T cells back to a patient when they have you know, active CD19 positive lymphoma in their body. These cells are expanding and they're act being activated to fight the lymphoma. So they're gonna cause the same cascade of events as, as if you were fighting a flu. The problem is this is sort of the flu on steroids. And so, um, you know, so many patients get just those number of symptoms that I just 
that I just uh, listed, but sometimes the inflammation and the activation of these T cells can be quite profound and uh, it can actually lead to lowering of patient's blood pressures, leaking of the blood vessels into things like the lungs and causing re uh, respiratory issues, um, even sometimes interfering with patient's uh, heart and kidney and liver function. Um, and so th those are all things that we monitor for very closely uh, sort of in this this week period after, um, one week period after the patients get their T cells. Now, now there's a second side effect that's, uh, that's been um, recognized with, uh, you know, more, more pronounced with the CD19 CAR T cells, which is this uh, side effect called neurotoxicity. And that can mean anything from sort of some mild confusion and disorientation. You know, people think that they're in their hometown or in their bed instead of being in the hospital. Um, many times it means uh, that patients develop a real difficulty with language. So they have a real difficulty speaking coherently and also understanding what people are telling them. Um, but, you know, but if uh, just like with cytokine release syndrome, which can uh, be somewhat mild and reversible and people get over it, but it can get more extreme, so can neurologic toxicity and patients can um, get quite sleepy, uh, somnolent, sometimes even go, in, go into a coma. Um, uh, those are rare circumstances, but those things can happen, um, and that's why patients need to be monitored very closely uh, after their CAR T-cell infusion. So then with that being said, after a patient receives uh, CAR T-cell therapy, are they required to stay in the hospital, and if so, for how long? So, um, so there, I think there are... Um, so with the two FDA approved products, there's no requirement that patients need to be in the hospital, but there is requirements for um, close monitoring for the seven days after the T cell infusion. I would say at Dana-Farber, we've opted to put these patients into the hospital and monitor them at least for the time being um, as we learn more about these toxicities and, and, their, um, risk, and the risk factors for developing the toxicities. On um, many of the clinical trials, um, most early clinical trials, patients did have to go into the hospital for a short amount of time for observation after the CAR T-cell infusions, but as we've learned more about the toxicity and again, what, what are risk factors for developing uh, some of these side effects, some of the companies on their clinical trials are moving towards outpatient dosing and then um, and potentially not, not requiring any hospitalization if a patient weren't to need it, so. So Dr. Abramson, now that's if when a patient does leave the hospital or if they are getting this administered at home, is, is a caregiver required uh, during CAR T cell therapy? Great question. Early on, yes. The most of this toxicity happens early on, within the first week or two. Uh, and so what we do recommend for patients who we treat as an outpatient uh, or for patients who we discharge uh, from the hospital is, at least for the first couple of weeks, that they do have somebody with them. Uh, and that's because some of the toxicity, particularly the neurologic toxicity, uh, might not be noticeable to the patient because they're confused. And so we need somebody with the patient who knows the patient, who knows if they're acting odd or off and can uh, bring that patient to the hospital uh, uh, so that we can care for them. The important thing about the neurologic toxicity, as well as the cytokine release syndrome, is that these are reversible side effects, but they have to be recognized and then inter intervened upon. And so if a patient is home and confused and doesn't know where they are, they're not going to bring themselves to our attention. Now that's unusual. And usually the, by the time we've sent the patient home from the hospital, they're largely out of the woods. Occasionally later side effects can happen. And so it is important. As we move more towards outpatient dosing with some of these CAR T cell products, it's going to be particularly important for patients to have a caregiver with them, at least for the first couple of weeks. So I think that's really important. And I want to go through it one more time. So then what should a caregiver be looking for if they are taking care of someone who's uh, recently undergone or is undergoing CAR T cell therapy and what signs should alert them? Well, for cytokine release syndrome, patients and caregivers most prominently need to look for fever. Fever is virtually always the heralding sign of cytokine release syndrome. So fever, malaise, uh, should be brought to the attention of the patient's physician. For neurologic toxicity, it can actually be remarkably subtle. So sometimes it's uh, a loved one saying, geez, you know, Joe is acting funny. He's just not himself, you know, or you well, talk. That would be myself. That would, yeah. that, that would be just you. So that's why you have to know right, you, right? right. Um, so sometimes it's word finding difficulties. Sometimes it's not knowing exactly where they are. Sometimes it's uh, uh, confusion. And sometimes it's just excessive somnolence, uh, sleepiness. Sometimes people uh, can be looking right at you and you're talking to them and they're not responding to you. And so it's really just anybody acting not themselves. And, you know, that is, we laughed at it, but that's why it is so important that somebody has a knowledge of the patient beforehand uh, 
or at least invest in them when they're going through these therapies. And the other thing we recommend is that at least for the first month after this treatment, uh, that not only do we want somebody to be uh, with a caregiver uh, or a loved one, uh, but we also don't want them to be too far away. Because if these side effects do happen, we want to be able to see the patient, we want to be able to treat them. So we officially say definitely within two hours uh, of, uh, of the treating center. And oftentimes, especially early on, we want people to be even closer to that so they can get to us in the event of side effects so that we can treat them. Excellent. One more time, as people come and go for our Facebook audience, I want to remind everybody that you are listening in and watching our CAR T-cell chat brought to you by the Lymphoma Research Foundation. We'd love for you to participate, so if you have any questions or comments, please let us know. Use the hashtag CAR T-cell chat, and we will ask uh, your questions to our doctors here. So with that being said, I want to um, talk about where CAR T-cell therapy is available. Is it a, a frontline or a uh, relapsed availability? So right now, CAR T-cell is available in the relapse setting, and specifically for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and the other uh, fast-growing B-cell lymphomas, it's uh, approved for patients who have uh, gone through at least two prior lines of therapy and haven't had a sufficient response. Um, it is being tested earlier, um, so for patients, for very high-risk patients who um, don't have uh, sufficient response to their first-line therapy or, or who relapse very early after their first-line uh, therapy, those patients are now, uh, can, can go on to a randomized clinical trial where they either get CAR T-cell therapy up front or they try that next second-line therapy, um, which would be considered standard of care. Um, so it's being tested earlier, but right now it's in the, uh, the relapse setting where patients have had at least two prior lines of therapy. And we mentioned earlier that it takes some time for these CAR T cells to be developed. Um, how long can that take and what is a patient going through during that time? So um, it can take anywhere from two to four weeks um, to manufacture the T cells. Um, and during that time, uh, patients you know, are having their, their lymphoma is growing um, and they uh, could potentially be getting increasing symptoms from their lymphoma, increasing side effects from their lymphoma. Um, it is possible that you could, if you knew, if you know, if you had an intervening therapy that might actually help the patient uh, feel better during that time, you, you could give the patient that therapy. But remember, these are already patients who have not done well with two prior lines of therapy. So it's it's hard to find a therapy that's going to give give substantial benefit without also um, giving some risk of you know infection and all the other things that come with giving more chemotherapy. So oftentimes we use steroids, um, which are a great temporizing effect have a great temporizing effect on lymphoma for a short while to help people, to bridge people through that time. And you want to add to that? I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> so then um, how can patients access these CAR T-cell therapies and um, learn about where it's being offered? So these are not available everywhere. Uh, this is a fairly specialized technology. It's uh, being offered at an increasing number of centers. Right now it's primarily offered at large academic medical centers. Um, currently, the FDA-approved CAR T-cell for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is available just over 40 centers in the United States, uh, and uh, that can be identified on the uh, KITE uh, or YesCARTA website. And so if you go to that website, it'll tell you which centers uh, are, are offering that therapy. They're predominantly large academic medical centers with stem cell transplant programs. And though we said this is not a stem cell transplant, it utilizes many of the same uh, infrastructure that's, that's used in the transplantation process. And so for that reason, uh, those are the centers that are being uh, initially activated. Ultimately, I think this will be a bit more broadly available. Uh, uh, but right now, it's, it's, I'd say, rapidly increasing. The Escarta was initially available only at 16 sites across the United States and is now available at over 40, and that's likely to continue to expand. So then right now, what are some of the biggest challenges facing uh, the CAR T-cell therapies? Well, I think there are several challenges. So one is the toxicity. Uh, and we've talked about the neurologic toxicity. We've talked about the cytokine release syndrome. These can be really quite profound, uh, uh, and they can be life-threatening, uh, although they are virtually always reversible. And one thing we've learned in the course of these clinical trials is when to intervene and how to intervene properly. Because of the toxicity risks, however, patients have to be sufficiently fit to go through this treatment. So it's not appropriate for everybody. Uh, patients who are very sick, uh, uh, bed-bound, for example, from their disease is, is unlikely to tolerate this treatment very well. So one of the challenges uh, is managing the toxicity in a way that we make this more broadly available. 
Another challenge is the time it takes to make the cells. And Karen talked about the, the goal of having an off-the-shelf version, that we don't have a two to four week delay during which time patients' aggressive lymphoma uh, can continue to grow, cause symptoms, or even render them ineligible to receive it. Another uh, uh, challenge, I'd say, is cost. Uh, and uh, these therapies don't come uh, cheaply. Uh, one product is dosed at around $373,000 per for that single dose. The other is uh, just under half a million dollars. And that doesn't include the cost of the hospitalization, of the supportive care, of the rescue medications used to treat the, the toxicities. And so I think at a health uh, system level, at a society level, uh, I think we're going to have to consider how these treatments are paid for uh, and reimbursed. Uh, and hopefully, with increasing amounts of CAR T cells on the market, and better manufacturing techniques over time that the, the cost of producing them and thus the cost to the healthcare system can come down. Dr. Jacobson, you, we mentioned the toxicity of Dr. Abramson, and Dr. Jacobson, you mentioned uh, chemotherapy before when it came to the stem cell treatments. Is there chemotherapy required with the CAR T cell therapies as well? So um, there is. It's very gentle chemotherapy, and it's not meant to have a, uh, an effect against the lymphoma itself, but it's really meant to, um, what it does is it actually decreases the number of T cells in the patient before they get their T cells, and what that does is it turns on a number of, of cytokines, which are stimulants for T cells to expand and grow, so that when the T cells are infused, they're uh, subsequently infused, they expand really, really well and nicely in the patient and, and can create the biggest army for the patient to fight the patient's cancer. So there is some chemotherapy, but it's, it's very gentle and mild, most gen gentler and milder compared to the chemotherapy that these patients have received previously, and then what would be used in a stem cell transplant. So if they have had a stem cell transplant previously, are they still eligible for the CAR T cell therapies? Um, so patients who have had an autologous stem cell transplant, which was the high-dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue, with the patient's own stem cells, and they've relapsed subsequently, those are patients who are absolutely uh, included in the label. The label's agnostic about whether patients have had a prior allogeneic stem cell transplant or donor stem cell transplant, and I think every institution is making a different decision about whether um, they feel that it, they can offer it to those patients or not. That's really an institution's decision. What's the biggest obstacle or question that they have to consider when uh, considering whether it was a donor stem cell? Well, I think the um, it just it hasn't been tested on clinical trials very widely. So um, for Yescarta, for example, for the clinical trial that led to the approval, allogeneic stem cell transplant patients were not included on that study. So we don't really just we just don't really have the safety data to to know. That being said, um, we know that for the acute leukemia patients who have gone on to get these products, many of them had had an allogeneic stem cell transplant and uh, subsequently relapsed and went on to CAR T cells and and did and the safety profile looked pretty good. Um, and uh, on some of the other uh, clinical trials in lymphoma with other CAR T cells, uh, they do allow patients who have had a prior allogeneic stem cell transplant. And again, the safety profile looks pretty good. So we have some data to suggest that it is safe, just not necessarily with this product um, specifically. So then with that being said, and, and Dr. Abramson, I'll turn to you, how important are these studies and these clinical trials to the advancement of the CAR T cell therapies? And what should patients consider well, the clinical trials are critical, and clinical trials are really the vehicle for progress, and they're the reason why we have two FDA-approved products right now, uh, why we're going to have additional ones uh, within the next year and beyond. And so participating in these clinical trials is essential. It's a way to potentially get the most cutting-edge treatment available, uh, and it's the way we learn how to manage the side effects, how to identify the toxicities, and how to make the treatments work better. Right now, we have a couple of products approved, but we're going to have additional ones approved. And so the next trials that we're already doing at our centers are thinking, how do we make this work even better? And how do we make them less toxic? So right now, uh, with the FDA-approved product for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, if you look a year later, about 40% of people, people are in ongoing remission, which is actually quite remarkable. Um, it means that these are patients who previously had no uh, uh, thoroughly effective treatments available to them, where their life expectancy would typically have been estimated at around six months. And now we're seeing a substantial proportion, about 40%, alive, free of disease, even a year later, uh, and may very well be cured uh, going forward. But that's only 40%. 
Uh, and that means that there's still patients we're not reaching with this treatment. So it isn't a panacea uh, for everybody. So thinking, how are patients developing resistance against this treatment? How can we prevent that resistance? How can we build a better mousetrap and make these CARS T cells work better as single agents or in combination uh, to obviate that, uh, that resistance from developing or to minimize the toxicity? So when you talk about that 40%, does that mean we're seeing a 60% relapse rate uh, with CAR T cell therapy? It means that either that 60% of people either don't respond to begin with, and that's about 20% of people who don't respond at all. So the majority of people do. Just over 80% of people respond to the treatment, meaning have their tumors reduced by more than half. Um, just about half of people go into a complete remission, uh, meaning no evidence of disease on their imaging. Uh, however, uh, between the 20% who don't respond at all uh, or an additional um, uh, uh, 40% who will subsequently uh, relapse after having initial response, it means a significant proportion of people will not be in durable remission long term. Uh, but that said, a significant proportion will. We just need to reach the other uh, people. So then, Dr. Jacobson, if CAR T cell therapy uh, isn't working for a patient, if they're not responding to it, what's the next course of treatment? So that's a great question, um, and uh, you know there we have a lot of drugs in our armamentarium and our toolkit to try to boost the activity of CAR T cells if they're still around. Um, and so you know the other immunotherapy drugs that um, uh, you know that we open this by by Jeremy talking about what immunotherapy was as a whole. So we have a lot of drugs that we can give to people that take the breaks off of patients' T cells so that their own T cells can hopefully fight their cancer. Um, and we can, you know, theoretically, if, if uh, there are some breaks on the CAR T cells that are still there, those drugs may actually um, activate those CAR T cells to have a, a specific anti-tumor effect. So um, oftentimes that's the first group of drugs that I, uh, that I reach for. So those are the, you know, for the PD-1, the PD-1 blockade drugs like pembrolizumab or nivolumab. Um, those are the drugs I, I try to give to someone in that setting so that we can, you know, both hopefully boost in an, uh, their own T cells that aren't CAR T cells against their lymphoma, but also try to boost their CAR T cells against the lymphoma. There are other drugs that we have that actually do have um, uh, stimulatory effects on T cells. I mean, uh, there's some evidence that drugs like abrutinib can do that. There are drugs like, like lenalidomide can do that. Um, so these are all things that you can try, um, but once patients do progress on CAR T cell therapy, because they've been, the, many of these patients have, are resistant to chemotherapy, there are really um, fewer and fewer options. So you mentioned uh, boosting the CAR T cells if they're still there after a certain period of time or treatment. Uh, typically, what stops happening? Do they stop uh, multiplying? Are they killed off? How long can you, is there an expectancy on how long those CAR T cells might remain in a patient at this point? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we don't really know that answer. Um, certainly, we've, you know, people have found the CAR T cells uh, in a patient a year after the infusion, but they're, they're in very small numbers. Um, and so it's not clear if they're providing, you know, lifelong surveillance for the cancer or if they're able to be activated in that setting. But it's definitely an area of research. Um, there, I should, I, one thing that I overlooked is that um, on some of these clinical trials, when someone did lose their response to CAR T cells, if appropriate, they were allowed to be redosed with CAR T cells. Now, that's not available um, with the commercial product, but that is that is a potential another strategy um, if appropriate. You know, so if we think if there's reason to think that another dose of CAR T cells would, would help somebody, um, that would be another avenue to take. When you talk about the some of the limitations before, one of the things, uh, Dr. Abramson, you mentioned was the fitness. So what would make it appropriate for somebody to go through a second round of, of CAR T cell therapy? Well, right now we really think of CAR T cell therapy as a, as a single round of treatment. Uh, and it isn't clear, though we have redosed some patients in the setting of clinical trials, uh, whether that's an effective strategy. And preliminarily, I'd say, to my eye, it doesn't work for most patients uh, to be reinfused. In fact, the majority of patients who are relapsing on CAR T cell therapy still have CAR T cells detectable in their blood and still have the target of the CAR T cells on the lymphoma, meaning the CD19. Which means that the problem for most patients isn't losing the target of the drug and isn't just eliminating the CAR T cells. It's that the, the tumor cells have developed a way to evade the CAR T cells. And so just giving more CAR T cells in that setting probably isn't the answer. As opposed to finding a way to manipulate that system, uh, give a drug that might uh, stop the tumor cell from hiding in plain sight. Give a drug that activates the CAR T cells to overcome the mechanism of resistance that's developed. 
So I think right now we're working on understanding, uh, is it a checkpoint inhibitor? Is it lenalidomide? Is it a brutinib or some other drug? And it might be that the mechanism in one patient is different from a mechanism of resistance in the other. So earlier we spoke about the different types of CAR T cells and the different types of second stimulation that goes into that. So is that a case where maybe it needs a different stimulation than the one that was initially given? I think it's a good question for, for research. Um, my suspicion, it's probably not a function of the co-stimulation uh, factor. It might be, however, that giving a CAR T cell directed at a different antigen uh, might overcome that. Uh, it might be that giving a CAR T cell that targets multiple antigens at the same time is the answer. And so this gets to building better mousetraps. I think we're going to develop smarter cars self-driving cars, perhaps, <laughs> uh, that can do an even better job over time. Right now, you know, as remarkable as these treatments are, as thoroughly effective as these treatments are in previously unreachable um, uh, patients with conventional tools, we're still at a fairly early level. It's still the infancy for CAR T cell therapy. And so we're, I think we're gonna see dramatic advances in the years to come. So with that being said, Dr. Jacobson, then what questions should patients be asking about CAR T cell therapies? So I think uh, the, you know, the most important question is whether it is a therapy that is appropriate for the patient. I mean, we, we do get, now, you know, it, it's, it's been in the media, we get lots of patients who come in who have never had any treatment for their lymphoma, and they want to know, you know, should they get CAR T cells, mm -hmm. or they come in wanting CAR T cells. Um, and I think that we have to remember that for the vast majority of lymphoma patients, chemotherapy is a very effective strategy. Um, and so, th you know, the first question is, uh, rather than be disappointed to hear that it's not for you, is, is, is you know, who are CAR T cells available for? Am I, is, is, it, is it an option for me? Um, and then the the other the other question is just is about whether it's um, the t the side effect profile and and the, and the um, the entire process is something that is um, you know some is, is compatible with that patient's wishes and their their lifestyle. So, are there any myths uh, out there right now about CAR T cell therapies that need to be debunked that you hear from patients? <laughs> Dr. Abramson, you're smiling for that one. Um, <laughs> Sure, I think there are myths. So I, I think one myth is that works, it works for everybody, that it's a magic bullet. Uh, no treatment in cancer is that right now, and this is included. It is a remarkable advance, but it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, so that's one myth um, that's worth dispelling. Another my uh, myth, I think, is that it's overly toxic. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, early on in the development uh, of these uh, products, uh, the toxicity could, was not only alarming, but we didn't really understand how to manage it, you know, because it was, these were brand new therapies. And there was some concern about giving antidotes against the toxicities would somehow damage the CAR T cells and stop them from working. So we weren't intervening on the toxicities and toxicities could get out of control. That's ancient history. We now understand when to intervene, uh, which is earlier. Uh, we know how to intervene. And there are, are, and there are uh, antidotes, including a drug called tocilizumab for cytokine release syndrome, including steroids like dexamethasone for the neurologic toxicities. Uh, and so by administering these drugs earlier in the course of toxicity, we can reverse them and patients can recover very well and often not get to the degree of severity uh, that I think uh, earned uh, uh, potentially a, a frightening reputation early on. Uh, and it's remarkable, once the toxicity is reversed and patients recover, they're fine. Uh, it's unlike a, something like a stem cell transplant where patients have gotten very intensive chemotherapy and take months to recover uh, their energy level. Uh, these patients did not get uh, intensive chemotherapy. The toxicity dies down and patients uh, have a restored and often improved quality of life. So I think that's an important myth to be debunked, that the toxicity uh, is not uh, in any way unmanageable uh, un uh, or um, uh, unpredictable. Excellent. Dr. Gibson, you mentioned that um, patients should figure out if they are uh, eligible for this mm -hmm. and if it's uh, the way to treat their lymphoma. When we discussed this a little bit, but what, what subtypes um, can this target? Um, so for, for, for YesCarda, what it's FDA approved for is it's FDA approved for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, um, a, another sort of high uh, aggressive B-cell lymphoma that's right now called high-grade B-cell lymphomas, um, and uh, transform follicular lymphoma, so the, an indolent lymphoma that transforms into an aggressive lymphoma, um, and primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. And where can patients go to learn more about the CAR T-cell therapy? 
Well, they can visit, um, I think, either website of uh, our institutions, uh, for sure. Um, and uh, I'm the, um, there are a variety of, uh, they can go to the website for Yes Carta or for Kim Raya to learn, to learn more about CAR T cell therapy. And then websites for advocacy groups for patients with leukemia and lymphoma um, have a lot of information about CAR T cell therapy on their websites. I'd have to recommend lymphoma.org, the website of the <laughs> Lymphoma Research Foundation, which has terrific educational resources, including on CAR T cell therapy. That's fantastic. Before we wrap up here, I, I want to get your opinion on where do you see the advancement in research going in the, in the near short-term future, say the next 24 months, and then looking further down the line, say the next 10 years when it comes to CAR T cell therapies? And I guess, Dr. Abramson, we'll start with you. So I think we're going to see big advances. So. Uh, on several fronts. One is going to be targeting additional diseases. So Karen just highlighted the smallest of aggressive lymphomas uh, that are currently uh, available for CAR T-cell therapy. But we're already doing clinical trials in several other lymphomas, including more indolent diseases like follicular lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, where the early results that we're seeing are remarkable as well. And so I think we are going to see this available for patients with chemotherapy-resistant disease with other uh, lymphoma histologies, as well as things other than lymphoma, like multiple myeloma in the not-too-distant future. The other big area uh, is going to be in combinations and in next-generation CAR uh, molecules. And so looking at, at, at fancier CARs that get developed over time, be they targeting different antigens, targeting multiple uh, antigens at the same time, uh, or being designed using some of this gene editing technology to be off-the-shelf uh, products. And then the other area is going to be in combination with other drugs, CAR T-cells plus drug X, Y, or Z that might optimize their efficacy and improve their safety. Okay. Dr. Jacobson? Um, I think that we're also going to see CAR T cells being used earlier in a treatment course for a group for groups of patients that we think are um, at high risk, where where we think that you know chemotherapy would just uh, give patients more toxicity and without. Um, uh, without clinical benefit. Um, and I think that uh, as you know, we've talked about trying to understand the different resistance mechanisms, trying to understand things that turn the CAR T cells off themselves, trying to understand why CAR T cells sometimes don't get to the, don't, don't even just get to the tumor, um, is going to allow us to, to optimize the CAR, to engineer them differently, um, so that we can actually not just, uh, not just use this in uh, blood cancers where it's, where it's been wildly successful so far, but also hopefully expand this to solid tumors, which are much more common than the blood cancers that we're talking about today. Excellent. Now, we do have a few questions here from Facebook. Uh, Tamara asks, uh, can Walden, Waldenstrom's, forgive me here, macroglobulinemia? You did a great job. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Be treated with CAR T-cell therapy. Great question. That Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is one of these more indolent B-cell uh, lymphomas that is not currently FDA approved. We have treated patients with Waldenstrom that is transformed into diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, with some success, and we've seen benefit in the underlying Waldenstrom's as well. So I think we have early evidence in clinical trials that it, it can be quite effective in this setting, uh, but that warrants ongoing evaluation in clinical trials. So currently, I'd uh, refer uh, interested patients to um, clinicaltrials.gov and to search for clinical trials that might be available. Right now, it wouldn't be available a as a commercial product. And then uh, someone asked, what is the follow-up care for someone who has received CAR T-cell therapy? So if you've gotten through the home care and, and the initial uh, treatment for it. So it actually is not very different than the standard of care visits that patients have been getting for their lymphoma up until that point. So as Jeremy said, that you know, oftentimes within you know, once you get through that sort of four-week period where um, the greatest risk of side effects is in the first two weeks, and there's maybe some small risk of developing recurrent side effects that in the two weeks following that, um, you know, once patients have recovered their physical stamina and uh, you know, and they and they feel well, um, their follow-up is really you know once every three months. Um, you know, uh, we you can see a response for the aggressive lymphomas as early as one month. So we usually do a post-treatment assessment around one month, um, and then the thing that we, in addition to just the normal care that we would give to a lymphoma patient every three months, the other thing we follow is the function of their B cells because their normal healthy B cells are. are um, 
are, are a target of the CARs as well as the cancerous B cells, um, and they're part of our immune system. So we can follow their immunoglobulin levels, which are a marker of B cell function, and if they fall below a certain level, we can give back immunoglobulin through an IV infusion uh, in order to protect infection. But other than that, there's really no other specific care for these patients that's different than their standard lymphoma care. So the quality of life when, once you've gone through the CAR T cell therapies can be pretty much where it was before someone had cancer? Or better. Yeah. Wow. Because they're cancer free. Wow, that's definitely amazing. Well, I want to thank both of you doctors for being with us. Uh, you've been watching our New England workshop uh, from the Lymphoma Research Foundation. I want to thank everybody for participating. Dr. Jacobson, Dr. Abramson, thank you so much for being here today. As a reminder, you can always catch LRF educational programs and more information on CAR T cell therapy by checking out lymphoma.org. Also, you can find more information at the Lymphoma Research Foundation's fact sheets and booklets. LRF is also developing materials specifically focused on CAR T cell, you, so you can check with the helpline. That number is 800 900 5576. One more time 800 900 5576. Seven, six, and lymphoma.org for more information. As always, we want to thank all of our sponsors who helped make this possible today. And please feel free to leave more questions in these comments and share this video so that we can help spread the word and more education about lymphoma research. Thank you for watching.